Okay, so hello and welcome back to another Unity tutorial. A while ago, I made a short, I think, five-part mini-series on the solid principles. So I made one video for each of the different principles, giving you, you know, examples, explaining why you would use it and how it benefits you. And I've not really done any video about best practices in a while, I don't think. So I'm going to do this video here showing you how I've been coding in my own time. As I've been working on Dapper Tools, which is down below on my GitHub page, or as I've just been working in Unity, Unity in general, I've been uh, designing my classes a bit differently rather than just jumping in, making a mono behavior and shoving all my code in there. I've kind of been separating out the code a bit more. So we've got like the actual core logic in a normal class and we've got a mono behavior, which is used essentially for dependency injection and just doing Unity API related stuff. And then I can easily write unit tests and it's so easy to expand upon. I'm going to show you guys that. I hope you look forward to it. Let's get to the video. But of course, first I've got to thank my patrons. Special thanks to some Hobo 101, Flow State Games, Average Morning, Luke Lafam, Hades Zorko, Rene, Evgeny, Art Farrell, Budaray, and Marie Baldwin. If anyone else is able to help support the channel monetarily, the link to my Patreon is down below. If not, I'd be greatly appreciate if you could go check out our website and actually create an account on there. It's completely free. You get access to all the stuff we're working on, on our like learning platform, you know, asking for help in tickets, um, requesting commissions. You know, there's, there's plenty of other things on there. Go, go look at it. We're obviously actively developing it. So if you keep looking every week or so, or every two weeks, you might notice some new features. I'll be doing videos on those new features as well. Join our Discord server to, you know, hear about those features and just check out all the links down below. It'd be greatly appreciated. Let's get to the video. Okay, so here I am inside the Dapper Tools project. Now, I'm not actually going to be, you know, developing anything for it. I'm actually going to be rewriting some code I've already written in the project just to show you uh, the actual process of writing this code and my thought process. And then once it's done, I can show you the unit tests I wrote for it and just, you know, keep on explaining why you might want to design in this way. And if you've got any questions about it at the end, feel free to ask below. Uh, but yeah, let's get to it now. So the quick example I'm going to show you first is you might have in your game something that you want to happen after time. It's a very common thing. You want timers in your game, right? So you might think, okay, I'm going to go write a timer mono behavior, right? So you make that timer and you put all the logic in there and you're done, right? It works. But then the problem is you might want to, you know, be able to reuse this timer, not in a mono behavior sense, right? Mono behaviors are limited to the scene. It's, um, I mean, you technically can, um, it's very awkward to work with mono behaviors if you're not on about something in the scene and components attached to things. So if you want to use code just as code and not scene related code, you just want to use normal Unity classes, or sorry, well, normal C sharp classes. But then you've already written all your logic in a mono behavior, so then you'd have to rewrite it in a non mono behavior class, but then you'd have to duplicate code. It's just a mess. That's what I'm going to mention in this video. So if you look here, if I search timer, I have the timer behavior, um, and then it has a duration and an on timer end. And the on timer end is a Unity event, which I can, for example, when the timer ends, uh, what can I do? I don't know. I can change the name of this object to be uh, hello. So it's currently game object, and after one second, it's going to be hello. And if I press play, We'll just see my timer work, right? Timer, it changes it to a low, and the timer goes away. Now, you know, I might want different things to happen. Maybe I don't want this timer to actually go away when it ends. Maybe I want it to kind of tick again and just keep going every one second, call this function. It's up to you, right? It's, it's your implementation. It doesn't really matter. For the sake of this, I just want to show you what I've done so far, okay? Um, let's go to the code. So obviously that code I just showed you, I've already written. So I'm going to, instead of just showing you the code uh, as it is, I'm going to actually write it out with you and explain how it works, okay? So... I've made a timer behavior. And the reason I'm not just calling it timer is because I actually want to have a separate class called timer that I use inside here. So this timer behavior is just the mono behavior kind of wrapper around the timer, right? The timer is not necessarily anything to do with Unity. It's just a timer. And then the behavior adds all the Unity like implementation itself. So what kind of stuff do we want to set in it? Well, if you remember correctly the way we did it, we had a duration and a Unity event for when it ends, right? So this is just Unity stuff, right? Now, the reason we have this uh, float duration that we pass in is because obviously we need to set the time as duration and we could expose this in the class and make the class serializable, but it actually makes more sense to keep the timer when we make it in a second, just completely private in here. And we just uh, inject essentially, just like dependency injection if you're used to using DI frameworks. This is essentially the dependency injection. We inject it in the inspector. We set all our dependencies in the inspector and pass those in through the constructor. So for example, we also have the Unity event. The timer itself, the timer shouldn't know about Unity events. Unity events should be kept in the behavior about Unity, right? Mono behavior is Unity. This is the Unity kind of version. So on timer end, okay. And then on start, what, what do you want to happen? Well, we want to actually start the timer, right? Now a timer, um, it's not necessarily something that you start, at least the way I've done it. It's more of a case of you, you tick the timer, right? You tick it every frame. So 
we want to actually have a timer class to actually have all our logic rather than doing it in here, okay? So the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna create another class. So if I go up to here and I'm just gonna create a new, uh, okay, I'm not using my Unity Explorer, so instead I'm just gonna copy paste this and just call this the timer, okay? So we'll call this the timer and we'll just get rid of these things that we wrote. So now this timer is nothing more than just a normal C-sharp class, okay? So all it is, get rid of all the, oops, it's reloading, okay. Just normal Unity class. And essentially this should do logic that has nothing to do with Unity. This should be just C-sharp code, shouldn't have any using Unity anythings. Now, sometimes you will need to have specific references to Unity related things in here, but if you can avoid it, try to, and you know, it helps a lot. So for example, we're gonna need a constructor to make a new timer, right? So public timer, there's our constructor. Currently does nothing, but obviously we want to, when we make a new timer, pass in the duration of the timer, like, you know, how long does it take to detonate? So we'll pass in a float duration, like so. And in the constructor, we want to set a uh, variable, basically, to be the duration. So we're gonna need some way to store, you know, how long has the timer got left? So let's make a float. Now, we might want it to be private at the start, but then again, other things might want to read how long's left on the timer, right? That seems like a very common thing you might want to do. So we'll make it public, a public float, remaining time or remaining seconds, right? And then this is gonna be a getter, but because we need to change it as well, like each frame, we also wanna make it a private setter. So you can't set it externally, you can only read it, but internally we can set it. And so here we'll say uh, remaining seconds is equal to the duration. So as soon as we make a new timer, it sets the time. Makes sense. And then we also want to um, have an event to raise when it's done because we want something to happen. Now we don't want to use a Unity event because you know maybe we're not using Unity. Maybe this is just a, another application you've got, right? Some kind of timer in some other game. Maybe you're just making a C-sharp game without Unity. This code can still be reused. We just want to use normal C-sharp events. So I'll make a public event action on timer end, okay? And now we need some way to actually tick down the timer. So we'll make a function for it, public void tick. Now we need to know the delta time. Normally you'd use time.delta time, but maybe you're not using this in Unity. Obviously you are, but the point is you want this kind of stuff to be passed in. You don't want to have the dependency on Unity for this code. There's no reason to. We'll let the mono behavior handle that. So we just want to be passed in a delta time. This also makes it easier to test because when unit testing, you can pass in the delta time to be whatever you want, right? And then over here, we're gonna basically say, well, if the remaining uh, seconds is zero return, because if you're implementing it differently to how I did earlier, you might not want the component to go away when it's on zero. So no matter what, the timer will never tick down if it's at zero, right? It will just stop. We also want to then say, all right, well, reduce the remaining seconds by the delta time because that's how much time has passed since the last time you called tick. And then we might as well have another function for checking if the time is finished. So we'll call that check for timer end. Oops, sorry. And then we'll do control dot enter, make the function. It's a private void check for timer end. And this will just have, as you know, the logic for doing that. So we want to say, well, if the remaining seconds is greater than zero F, return. So we don't want to do anything else if we've still got time left. But if there is no time left, then instead we want to set the remaining time to zero because it might have gone past zero right when you have the delta time being bigger than the actual remaining time so let's say there's 0.1 seconds left but delta time is 0.2 then you take off 0.2 and you end up being at minus 0.1 so this just sets it back to zero it's useful if you want to display something on the ui from a timer um if you go negative health or negative time or negative anything you always want it to stop at zero if it makes sense too so just gonna set that back to zero and then we're also gonna raise the event because at this point we are done if we you know reach this point so on timer end question mark dot invoke um so the question mark basically says if it's not null if there if there are any listeners then we'll do it otherwise we won't okay and that's it for this that's the timer done we just tick the timer down when it's done it raises an event that's all a timer is now we need some way to tick this using the game loop and then unity the game loop is the update function really so first of all we're going to need a timer to actually tick so we're just going to say private timer timer Okay, so here's our timer. It's null at the start though, we just have a way to store it. And we're just gonna say, when we start the game, we'll set the timer equal to a new timer with the duration, duration. We're setting it in the inspector. 
So obviously the timer class doesn't know anything about Unity or the inspector, but we're making use of this layer of abstraction using the mono behavior to pass the data in. And then we're also going to subscribe on start for the timer dot on end. So when the timer ends, what do you want to do? We want to, for example, uh, handle timer end. Okay. We can then generate a method for that. <coughs> so it's a private void. Gen handle timer end. And here, what do we want to do? Well, when a timer ends, we want to raise the Unity event for it. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's a bit sore. Um, so when the C sharp event is raised, we're actually raising a Unity event. Now, some people might complain about the performance of this saying, oh, well, events, you know, whatever, whatever. But to be honest, it's really not a big deal. You know, it's definitely worth the payoff for this slight. I mean, it, you, it won't even, you won't even notice it really unless you're doing it every frame. Um, un unity events, some people seem to be scared of Unity events because of, you know, the performance, but yeah, unless you're using them for every little thing, every frame, it's not a big deal because the fact it allows you to be um, so much more customizable, customizable, I don't know. Um, you know, the problem with using normal events like C sharp events is you can't dynamically like design with them in the inspector. It's very hard to do that. That's what Unity events are for. You can design event callbacks. Whereas normally, if you want to use C sharp events, you have to do it in code. You don't want to have to go in code to change stuff when you can just do it in the inspector, it makes life so much easier, right? Um, like just there, when I showed you earlier in the example, on timer end, change the name, whatever. If we actually wanted to do that in code, we'd have to write an extra class to handle that subscription to that specific thing. And it, it's just a mess, right? Use Unity events where they're meant to be used and it'll save you a lot of time and a lot of typing and a lot of everything. <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna invoke that event. And then the way I've set it up is that we destroy this, uh, we destroy this. Now, you don't have to, but I'm, I might as well go ahead and do it, right? So destroy this, which destroys this component, not this game object, right? So this component goes away, but the thing it's on doesn't. It's up to you what happens, uh, whatever else happens. And then all we need now is to actually tick the timer. So private void update. On update, we want to say timer.tick. So we're gonna tick the timer. It wants a delta time. So we are the unity layer. We are allowed to know about time to delta time, the unity class. So we can just pass that in, okay? And there you go. So now we've got this timer behavior and we've got the timer, which actually has the logic for a timer. We just do the extra layer stuff on top of it, right? So if I go back to Unity, uh, there's not even any point showing you it really because I showed you it earlier and it's probably gonna have some problem because now there's two classes with the same name. It'll probably just come up twice. Yeah, timer behavior, they're both the same really. So yeah, it works, okay? Now you might think, okay, yeah, that's it, right? That's nice and all, it, it works. But you know, another huge benefit is if you're unit testing, which you should be doing, this makes it so much easier to unit test because some people will say, yeah, you can just create a new instance of a mono behavior. You can like in your unit test, make a new game object and add a component, but there's no need. You don't want to worry about any unity stuff in these kind of unit tests. You just want to test, you know, you, you assume unity have unit tested their own code and sorted all that out. You just need to unit test your own code. You don't need to test if any unity stuff works, just if your stuff works. So if I go over to the unit test real quick, so if I go over to the, the runtime tests, components, timer tests. You'll see here on my other screen when I bring it over. Here are my timer tests, okay? So for example, when a, here we make a new timer, right? Nothing to do with Unity, just a new timer. We pass in a duration and we just make sure that it's the remaining time. You know, it is a pretty weird test. It's not necessary, but I just thought I'd do it. It's a test where we're making sure that when we pass in the starting duration, it's the same as the remaining time, okay? Probably not necessary to do this test, but I've done it, so what, what, whatever, right? Now we're checking, does it stop at zero when we tick below zero? So because I said we pass in the delta time rather than it getting it from Unity, we can now kind of fake pass in fake time just to see if it works, right? So we're saying, okay, here's our timer and it's got one second left and we're gonna pretend that two seconds have passed. Now you would expect maybe it would go to minus one, but you don't want that to happen. You want it to stop at zero. So we're saying, is it zero? If, it's, if it is zero, then uh, it asserts true, meaning the test passes. So this is a way to make sure that we can't go below zero. Then when the timer ends, is the event raised? Just making sure that that still works. So we're saying, well, here is a timer with one second on it. We have a Boolean that's false, but if the when the timer end uh, is raised, we will set the of this Boolean to true. So it's false, but it becomes true when the timer ends. Then we say ticket for the one second. And because it's a one second timer, this should get set to true. And then we say if it's true. And then over here, we want to say, let's just make sure, you know, it's nice and all saying the event is raised when the timer ends, but for all you know, the event could be just raised anyway. So let's do a check to see if the timer isn't, uh, sorry, the event isn't raised if the timer doesn't end. So we've made a one second timer and we tick it for half a second. It should not have been raised. It should, 
is false, it should be raised false, right? So these are my tests for the timer. And then obviously if I go to my test runner and run whatever, you'll see it passes. I mean, components, timer tests are here. They're all, here they are. Let me just close this down. Here are the timer tests and they all pass, okay? Most of them take zero seconds or 0 0.001, you know, super fast to do. Um, obviously there's all these different versions of this one I've done. Um, but yeah, that's basically it, right? So we've got unit tests for my code. I know this timer code works. It's very simple code, but the point is it's very easy to expand on this. Now I've done this same logic elsewhere, right? I've got other places in my code where I have a class and a behavior version of the class. And if I go to, for example, uh, movement, I've got a movement class and a movement behavior. And the movement behavior has this. Now this is a quite common thing I've done as well. If I want to ever reference the class from another behavior, right? Let's say I want to reference the timer from somewhere else. What I'll do is I'll make the timer have a private field, but a public getter. And what happens is when I request the movement, we check if this like private variable, if the private field, if it's not null, we return it. But if it is null, we create it. So it's called like lazy loading. Rather than loading on start, we load it when we need it, which most of the time will be right at the start. So it's fine anyway. But what it means is if you always refer to this variable rather than this one, um, then it means it'll never be null, or at least if it's null, it'll create a new instance and then give you that one, right? So when we say tick movement, we don't have a start function in here saying set it up. We just, on tick, we say refer to movement. So we're going to get movement. We're going to say, okay, movement. If this is not null, return it. But because it is null the first time you request it, we set it equal to a new instance. Now the movement class um, only cares about the character controller dependency. That's a dependency it needs, I need to know about a character controller to move. So this, the mono behavior passes it in, right? That's the point. The mono behavior is to kind of wrap this around. And the mono behavior handles the ticking in the update, right? This is a common thing. If you need to tick in your normal class, you pass that in through the mono behavior. With delta time, this is quite a common thing and it makes sense. Then inside the movement class, we set our thing here. We have movement modifiers. This is some of a code. I don't need to explain how the code all works. The point is all this code, um, you see, I, I can add modifiers here. Now the way you can even call this function is by referring to the movement instance in here through this uh, getter, right? So another class can refer to the movement behavior. So we can have a serialized field movement behavior. And then from movement behavior, you can say movement behavior dot movement dot add modifier. And you can modify the movement and stuff. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Obviously it was kind of short, just explaining a design pattern. If you guys have any questions about it, feel free to ask below. Feel free to give suggestions and improvements. Um, some people might not see the use of this if their game scope is really small or they're new, but believe me, as you design, you know, bigger games, more complex games, this kind of design can actually help a lot because um, when you, for example, start using interfaces, one problem with Unity is interfaces in the inspector. So you can actually still make use of interfaces. You'll, you'll have to make different mono behavior instances, but it's actually a much better trade-off than just not using interfaces at all because it allows you to um, avoid writing awkward place like awkward code where you've got like switching and casting so you've got to say like oh if it's a type of this then do this or if it's this type do this or if it's this type do this you don't want that in your code really the only time you ever should use enums and switches is when you've got um, like code that won't be expanded upon when you can like be 100% certain or like 99% certain you'll never come back and change it if it's the kind of stuff that will change based on the content of your game, let's say you have um, a damage types enum for like physical and magical and whatever. Well, the thing is, you never know down the line, you might, for the sake of content, want to add new damage types. So that's when you should make it uh, not necessarily an interface, but you might want it to be a scriptable object. Um, because then what you can do is you can create a new scriptable object instance and put the data there without having to... Um, go to an enum file, add a new enum instance, and then go to some other code and then add a new switch case for the enum. You know, it makes much more sense to use interfaces and stuff like that. So if you want more videos on design patterns, feel free to let me know that as well. Um, if you want more videos on interfaces and just how to write better code, you know, ask those as well. That that includes not just Unity, but other areas, like every area of uh, object-oriented programming should use solid and because um, that's one of the main points in object-oriented programming is, you know, how to write it well using the tools you've got, like interfaces and abstraction and um, in Unity se uh, sense it's components, which will then lead into ECS, which is a completely different ball game. But anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. You know, you can get access to this code in my Go uh, repository for Dapper Tools down below. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching and goodbye.